Good evening class, how are you all? I hope you all doing good. A very warm welcome to the today's class of MBBT, day third, um, where we will discuss some exciting things related to various techniques with MBBT. And uh, let's enjoy the workshop for today. Yeah. I hope most of the students are being connected. So I sent the link quite before today so that most of you could be joined by now. So we were doing yesterday any question students first of all anything that you want to discuss before we go ahead. I'm also fine, um, but I missed my today's evening uh, gym session. So I had small gym in my house. So I missed that. So I'm feeling a bit lazy. I should have done that. Some days are there that you miss your routines and you should not have actually. And, and you feel guilty about it when you miss your routines. So today is that day for me a guilty day maybe i will recover that tomorrow by doing it in morning and then evening too so you have to compensate your things when you are uh, into some routines uh, your routines got distorted so try to compensate that so that um, your routine should not be um, distorted
I'm having a bit uh, nose running. I don't know why it should not happen. Fluorescent, yes, but go ahead. So students, uh, in meantime, we can start from the yesterday's lecture that we were doing. The animal tissue culture. So cell culture, why we do it? So th this what we are doing is from the yesterday that we left. So we were quite late yesterday by 10 p.m. And I thought maybe it's too much for all of us. So I drop it to the next day. So we are continuing with that now. So cell culture, it may helps to make proteins on commercial levels, stamens, can cancer cells we can work upon, primary and human animal cell culture, we can do embryo culture, gene therapy, uh, Antibody production monoclonal uh, antibody productions like monoclonals. So cell culture, why we do it? Uh, there are tools for study of animal cell biology uh, using for convenient in metro uh, model of cell growth. So to mimic. So to mimic the in vivo cell behavior that how they are happening example for example in cancer cells how cancer cells are moving inside your uh, body and artificial uh, sometimes uh, some cell types are those difficult to culture so they are highly selective uh, defined environment which is easily manipulated. So cell culture is a in a tissue culture laboratory bench top should be kept clear, uh, clean and clear that we have discussed yesterday that you have a long sleeve lab coats so that you have minimum uh, contaminations by your uh, clothes or by hairs. Uh, always wear gloves while working on the tissue culture uh, work so that we can have skin organisms should not come into your cell culture. Surfaces, uh, gloves, solutions, plastic wares should be sprayed with 70% alcohol before placed into biological hood. So please do take care when you are working in the uh, cell culture department. So we were doing these things most of the times whenever we are doing cell culture. Solutions, reagents, glasswares used in the tissue culture work should not be shared with non-tissue culture work. So primary applications of animal cell culture in, is investigating the cell cycle control uh, structures of uh, cancer cells, detection of production function of uh, growth factors, hormones, viruses, the study of differentiation processes, specialized cell functions, 
cell 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 matrix interaction so all these things have to be taken care so what is the difference between primary cell culture and cell line so primary cell culture is the freshly isolated from the tissue source cell line is from the finite cell line so it dies after subculture so they will die after some cultures and continuous cell lines they are the immortal ones so passaging we, we did yesterday that how you can passage your cells from one culture to another so that they, they, they did not die and you can split them into two flasks so contact inhibited monolayer of uh, uh, normal layer so they are not being in contact so the monolayer are inhibited because of this therefore need to split them to maintain the growth so there's a growth medium we add so multi uh, multi layer of inhibited uh, cancer cells are there now plant tissue culture dishes uh, looks like this so initiation establishment propagation of cell culture so culture culture uh, can be initiated from uh, tissue organ fragments si uh, single cell suspensions so choice has to be made whether you want from the desegregation techniques, media, culture conditions, uh, selection procedures. So while doing so, uh, some considerations have to be maintained like uh, most of the primary cells should be satisfactorily adherent to the surface, uh, limited span of some cell cultures, uh, spontaneous transformation has to be seen. Uh, some cells are not normally adherent in vivo and can be grown in liquid suspension. Dispersal of the tissues mechanically, chemically, enzymatically can be done or could be done with combination. So in mechanical you can do mincing, shearing and by sieve tube. Uh, but enzymatically you can do it with the proteases that affect the extracellular matrix. Or you can do it with enzymes like trypsin, pronase, collagenase this space so they could all uh, differentiate in your cell culture so cell culture environment could be 8 well cell culture 96 well uh, plate culture so it depends upon how you are looking for your results so your cell culture uh, will be transformed into that type so factors that are affecting cell behavior in the complex uh, of in vivo environment are uh, local marker environments such as metabolites, local growth factors, ECMs, architectures, cell-cell interaction, circulating proteins, cytokines, hormones. So all these uh, works a lot. And cell culture uh, surface, they should be adhered to the surface, uh, chain charge of the surface, coating with the matrix proteins, collagens, laminin, gelatin, fibronectin. Uh, you have to coat uh, these with the matrix proteins uh, on the surface also media formulations media we have discussed yesterday in quite details that uh, it should have amino acid sugars uh, vitamins supplemented with serums uh, extremely specific defined medias for for things so this is how the dmem medias constitute looks like you have to order all these uh, things has to be there like amino acids vitamins inorganic salts and other components Amino acids should include from your glycine to uh, arginine, cytosine, vitamins, it should include calcium, uh, pantothenate, uh, folic acid, inositol, uh, nictinamide, so riboflavin like this. Media formulations, inorganic ions, uh, osmotic balance should be maintained, cell volume. Trace elements has to be maintained like cofactors for biochemical pathways, amino acids, vitamins and energy sources. So all these things matters a lot when you are creating your media. So serum we have discussed about them in details that provide the basic nutrients, uh, hormones, uh, attachment to the spreading factors, uh, binding proteins, hormones, vitamins, minerals, protease inhibitors, pH buffers, so all being taken care in, in, in so the gas phase so gas carbon dioxide should be maintained oxygen should be maintained uh, while maintaining your cell culture aerobic metabolism atmospheric tissue level between one to seven percentage so carbon dioxide incubator looks like this uh, should be maintained uh, with controlled carbon dioxide humidified uh, humidified 
37 degrees Celsius. pH has to be maintained uh, around 7 because this could affect the cell metabolism, growth rate, protein synthesis, availability of the nutrients and carbon dioxide could act as a buffering agent in combination with sodium bicarbonate in the media. Temperature has to be maintained, humidity, uh, normal body temperature is 37 so humidity should be maintained at saturating uh, level as evaporation can lead to changes in osmolarity and volume of the media detritus. So we have the media now, everything is done. Now let's see how to minimize the risk of contaminations. So sources of contaminations in our cell cultures are bacteria, fungi, mold, yeast, mycoplasm, other cell types, and free organisms, dust particles, or aerosols, and surfaces or equipments have to be taken care. So these are the class one uh, cabinets. Uh, you're showing you preparation of the primary cell culture is done in these them and in one of those so remove the muscles from mice protect the product uh, product only so all the all the primary cell culture work is done uh, in these kind of chambers and this is uh, class 2 cabinets where protection of personal environment and product laminar flow food is done so here there is a glass uh, glass is there and this is laminar airflow on the top so the air is going from inside to the inside only so uh, maybe uh, air is not able to go in from outside to inside so the flow is made from inside to inside only but no air could uh, can enter from the outside so whenever we are going to enter our hands also we have to uh, we have to wear gloves in our hands and with 70 percent ethanol uh, we have to wash uh, wash our hands also then start the work with the cell culture So like this, there's an air barrier which does not let the enter to the air and you have air coming in and going from here down and going up, then coming in and going up. That's how HEPA filters uh, laminar airflow works. So aseptic uh, techniques that you have to maintain while you're doing your tissue culture. Uh, control environment, sterile media and reagents, avoid air contamination of solutions, manual contamination of equipments, avoid repeated opening of bottles, 70% ethanol swab has to be used, uh, UV irradiations before and after, only use disposable equipment once. So aseptic techniques uh, like lab coat, gloves, tip does not touch the tube, holding the tube while you are working. So all these things have to be maintained while you're doing your work. So these are the uh, micro filters of 0 0.2 micro membrane filters. So where you can uh, filter out your if, if any bacteria or mycoplasma present from the media, you can filter out with the help of these uh, micro filters. So whatever uh, I have taught you today. Um, it will be very necessary if you're going to start working in the lab, in the cell culture lab, animal tissue culture lab. So all these things have to be taken care because uh, otherwise uh, you will have contamination in your cell culture and all the work, uh, your day and night work will be uh, wasted out. So please, 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 uh, these slides are really, really important if somebody going to start with the cell culture techniques. So... So these are the slides from the myogenesis. They are showing the muscle regenerations uh, likely to form microtubes in the culture. So here we are seeing some in vivo results. And these are the in vitro results. Myotubes form of the myoblast grown in the culture after the seven days. So that's how we see them in the cell culture tubes, cell culture in the plates. So we use inverted microscope for them to see the results. So this is how uh, the proliferation of myoblast after 24 hours of subculture looks like and this is the differentiation and fusions happen uh, at 7 days in fusion medium with 2% HSDMEM. So you can see a big difference. So they are going up and up on each other and creating a chaos so which is uh, not so good for the CC2, C12 mouse skeletal muscle cell line. But this one is good. This is good cell culture.
it's so like you should have always 70 percent confluence uh, confluent um, surface not uh, not less than that or more than that and then you count your cells by uh, hematocytometer uh, you can check uh, that you just put your samples of of your with, with the cell culture and then you count how many cells are there and then you multiply them by four like you can check on this scare this scare this scare and this scare and then you multiply them by four and take an average out of it you can calculate at least four of these and then divide by four and then uh, yeah you will have an average how many cells are present so for proliferation and differentiation, different medias are there. For proliferations, you need uh, after nutrient mix, FCS and BFGF. And uh, for the differentiation, you need DMEM, 2% uh, horse serum, insulin, uh, linoleic uh, acid. For fusions, uh, media change from nutrient rich to the nutrient poor. Uh, induced withdrawal from the cell cycles with the three choices, uh, dye, senescence or differentiation. So these are some analysis that you can see the adult mouse skeletal muscle cells primary culture that we found uh, which which are also con consisting of fibroblast on a 8 well slide plate and, and they are stained with the desmin dye. So these uh, fibroblasts are the ones with the long ones and, the, and you also see the skeletal muscles here. So both are being uh, visible. These are the cell lines of H2KB cultured on that 35 millimeter dish, fixed and stayed with the desmin. And these are the skeletal muscle cell lines stained with the desmin green to identify the myotubes and hoax to identify the cell nuclei. So the, the small blue ones are the nuclei. Uh, we, we dye it with the hoaxed and the green one is the desmin, the myotubes, the big myotubes. So that's it from the uh, from the previous yesterday's lecture. So today is day three. Uh, molecular biology methods. Oh, there is a question. I have found that fluorescent microscope, especially in the in confocal one images are mostly red and green in color and sometimes yellow but really see blue color for see blue color for some is there any specificity no as i discussed just just now as we have discussed just now uh, with our last image uh, what you were seeing was that the blue was uh, nuclei and the green was like this image blue was a nuclei and, and we dye the other things with the other dye so whatever the you, you do the dye that's you gonna see because the antibody will attach to that part only not to other part so that's how uh, the chemistry biochemistry of antibodies works out specifically to the nucleus and to the myotubes in this case uh, that's why uh, the fluorescent images of things that what we are seeing is uh, looks like that yeah so let's start with today's lecture that is uh, techniques uh, in molecular biology uh, where we will be discussing about PCR gel electrophoresis blotting techniques a little bit uh, gen, uh, gene expression analysis, real-time PCRs, microarrays, recombinant DNA technologies, Sanger and next generation sequencing, uh, method to study gene function, cell culture methods, generations of transgenic mice and knockout mice. So that's the pr main principle that we'll be discussing today for you and uh, so let's start. So on the first day we discussed little bit about PCR but we will go in details today uh, that is PCR can be uh, used to amplify rare complex DNA sequences from a complex mixture when the end of the sequences are known. 
so pcr amplifications of mutant alleles allow detection of human genetic diseases uh, dna sequences can be amplified by pcr for use in cloning as probes and in forensic so carry mules a uh, nobel prize for chemistry 1993 so this is a uh, pcr done amplification of dna so here you have uh, your target genomic DNA and you, this is your target sequence. First denaturation is done, heat briefly to separate DNA strand. Then annealing is done to cool down your primers to form hydrogen bonds with the end of target sequence. Then extension is done to DNA polymerase add nucleotides to the 3' prime end of each primer. Then cycle 2 yields uh, of 4 molecules and then further cycle 3 will yield 8 molecules. So like this, uh, we can we can uh, keep keep growing our things. So in the PCR mixture, you need buffer, template DNA, primer, nucleotides, DNA polymerase, and water. So to start with further, let's go for one uh, so two notifications. Uh, one virtual lab. of PCR. So the human genome um, The human genome is made up of 3 billion chemical base pairs. Scientists often need to isolate a, a very specific segments of DNA from within a vast amount of genetic material. Since this segment is just one tiny pieces of genomes, they need many copies to have enough to work with. So this is cell nucleus. In the nucleus you have DNA. having many copies of it. So polymerase chain reactions give you 100 billion of identical copies of specific DNA sequence in matter of hours. As inventor of PCR explained, the technique requires no more than just a test tube, a few simple reagents and a source of heat. So that's how you can run your PCR. Uh, so this is your hair follicle. So to perform PCR, you just need any sample uh, because purpose of PCR is to create copies of your DNA uh, with a specific sequence and you can extract from blood, skin, saliva or even hair follicles to do so. So let's start by moving your extracted DNA into special uh, PCR tubes. Our PCR tubes are here, our samples are here and it's just work by heating and cooling, that's it over and over so PCR tubes are designed for even heat, even heat distributions. So this is our PCR tube. So drag the extraction DNA to the PCR tube. So our DNA is here. We extract them into our PCR tube. Now add primer 1 uh, to the PCR tube so that uh, they are powerful tools for copying very specific DNA sequences and change the target sequence at the wrong sites. So we take the primer 1 and we add to the PCR tube. Now we will add primer 2, add to the PCR tube. Now we will add nucleotides like A, C, G, T which will, will be making a new copies of your of your DNA sequence so they will act as a genetic building blocks and will be created to make uh, billions of your DNA copies. So we take it and we add it. Science is very simple it's just like cooking uh, you add some masalas you make a tadka and then uh, you add your dal then boil some rice your dal chawal is ready so this is how I see things uh, in science. So this is just there's a recipe for that. Uh, you just have to uh, go through the recipe, and you have your things at the end that you're looking for. 
now we will add dna polymerase which will help the reactions to happen and to create the dna copies to stand with the pcr reactions so we will add dna polymerase in the pcr tube so your pcr tube is full now it has now uh, dna samples primer 1 primer 2 uh, nucleotides and dna po uh, polymerase so five things have been added to it So we take it and put in the PCR tube in the thermocycler and then you start. So this is uh, the target sequence. Inside your PCR tube cycle has begun. The thermocycler heat ups to the 95 degrees Celsius and so like around 203 degree almost like boiling so this is a boiling temperature so which will help to separate your D, uh, dna double helix so creating single standard uh, dna molecules so they are thermal cyclers uh, so we will add at 50 degrees celsius your primer one and primer two will be joined at this temperature and they will lock to the target uh, sequence then add we will make temperature of 72 degrees celsius first was 95 then 50 then 72 and it will go for further reaction so it will create a complementary dna sequence and cycle one is complete now So the same three steps uh, happen. So we make it to 95 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius, primers are attached, then 72 degrees Celsius, DNA polymers are attached. So in cycle two again, uh, you have a more copies of DNA sequence. Then in cycle three, we separate them again, do it like that. So you have now desired fragments at the cycle of at cycle three now, these desired fragments. So like this, we will have 30 cycles and reactions will keep continuing. We fast forward this. So 30, 60, 30 cycles, we have billions of copies of our target sequence. And we have now solutions of nearly target sequence that we were looking for. I will share this PCR thingy with you all students. Okay. Any questions so far students? Only then we will start with the next topic. Um, once this is clear, then we go to the next topic of PCR, uh, next part of our uh, various molecular biology techniques. So it's going to be long day. So we go slowly and slowly, steady, easy pace. Because we don't have Okazaki fragments, in lagging strengths we have Okazaki fragments, remember? So we have leading and leading strands. Leading strands is is uh, is made by cutting by the helicase enzyme uh, with the help of top isomerase. So we are, we are adding also um, DNA ligase enzyme to that. But all these things are uh, not required in this case. So we just need simple. Uh, we just need simple uh, and as as uh, just nucleotides, DNA polymerase and all these uh, primer 1, primer 2 and you have a desired sequence and you can uh, go, go with that. So but for using the primer, I, I, I used to have a one software for that. I am sorry, I, I, I lost that software thingy. So we used to have one software which calculate automatically your primers so which primers has to be used for particular sequence because if say uh, for particular disease or some cancer gene 
uh, we want to check whether that uh, particular primer is present or not so so it is already known that that particular sequence is known to be uh, is to be done with that so you can um, build that primer uh, with the help of that software then primer 1 and primer 2 and then you can send it to the primer 3 okay then uh, you can send it to the uh, to the company and they will send us back primers all the primers and then you can start your reactions with dark polymerase and nucleotides and uh, with your samples into it and then things will, will, will be going well primer 3 I, I was doing all these things quite long ago so now I'm not into the routine so that's why yeah it sounds good primer 3 Yeah, here you can. The I am I'm remembering that your yeah, primer size, primer uh, temperatures, product temperatures, uh, primer GC percentage. So there are many factors that you have to uh, take care while doing so. Um, so someone who is in routine of uh, making these primers, uh, most likely if you if you are into these things in the lab that you will join, they will know about it, and they will get to know about that thing that how to create your primers for that. So don't worry much about that. So what is the difference in RT? Real-time PCR, real-time quantitative. Oh, we, we are doing this in next part. So we will be doing that. That's that's how our all um, COVID tests are being done with RTQ-PCR with the help of that. Uh, rapid uh, fluorescence. Random amplified polymorphism RPDs. Remember when temperatures increase, both strands of matter. Okay, so I think I have answered your question. So, some questions I am not able to answer because. So, uh, oh, asymmetric PCR. So I have to Google this one. I never heard this term, so I'm excited to know about that too. Asymmetric is a variation of PCR used to be preferentially amplify one strand of DNA more than one. So somebody was asking about asymmetric PCR. It's a variation of PCR which is preferentially amplify one strand of DNA from one from more than another's. This technique has application in some types of sequencing, hybridization probing, where having only one or two complementary strand is required. Okay, I didn't understand. There are a lot of variations to the system, multiplex, nested, asymmetric, assembly, touchdown, digital, suicide PCR, VNT PCR, side-directed mutagenesis, cold PCRs, isothermal PCRs. So they are huge. Okay, that's good to know. That's the new, that's what I like uh, to be share with you things so that we as a, as a teachers also get to know about the latest things that is happening. So I was stuck with my knowledge to that level. So I got to know about uh, these uh, various others. So you have abundant primers, a non-targeted strand, targeted strand, limiting primers on this side. So target strand DNA. So okay. 
so we have asymmetric so it's not symmetric so on one side primers are abundant primers on the other side they are the less primers so you have target sing uh, single stranded dna's uh, like in this case and you have double stranded dna so we have a uh, mixture of both in that case so i will share this link with students uh, knowledge base so this is i like it i like this one it's a big link DMEM, it's a uh, minimal uh, essential medium which is required for the synthetic cell culture medium uh, and uh, can be used to maintain cell culture and tissue culture. This is just like a medium that we used. <clears throat> okay, so let's get to the next part. Um, analysis of nucleic acids So DNA molecules can be chemically synthesized and uh, so rather than using existing DNA pieces new DNA can be designed and synthesized. So useful for in vitro generation of new gene structures, polylinker generations, primers and probes and generating new designer genomes. <coughs> So they are like monomer 1, monomer 2, they are coupled together and then after the coupling, uh, there is a weak acid is made. Then oxidation is done of that, then you have base 1 and base 2 with these two sugar bases, they are being attached together and same way the monomer 3, monomer 4 could be attached by uh, all, and, and could be make an oligonucleotide at the end. So gel electrophoresis resolves Just a second. And then further uh, in the analysis of uh, nucleic acid, gel electrophoresis resolve DNA fragments of different sizes. So you first restrict your DNA with restriction uh, enzyme, then place your mixture in the well of agrose gel and apply electric field, negative and positive. Your cell will follow from negative to positive field and there are some pores inside there. And from these pores, the shorter will move further and the longer will remain at the top. So that's how you separate your different clones, uh, 1 to 5 clones and this is the ladder and you can visualize uh, your gel electrophoresis like this. So there are also uh, southern blotting and northern blotting. Southern blotting is done to detect specific DNA fragments and northern blotting is done to check specific mRNAs. So this is how we will not go through them today in details. There is some specific day for them. So in the southern blotting, you have a DNA cleave with restriction enzymes. Uh, then you have a gel electrophoresis and you transfer the everything to the nitrocellulose membrane. After the transformation of the nitrocellulose membrane, you hybridize the DNA with RNA probe or DNA probe. And then you have an autogram of that. And then in the case of uh, northern blotting, the same thing will happen. But instead of that, you have... Uh, total RNA uh, is working out. You are working for the RNA part. Now comes the next part, uh, uh, real-time PCR for gene expression analysis. 
so allows a real time monitoring of PCR amplification products uh, used by fluorosense. So here the fluorosense is the main principle that is working out. So in the first step reverse transcription of RNA into complementary DNA is done. So first your uh, RNA of reverse transcription is, comp is, is transferred to complementary DNA and either quantitative or semi quantitative measurements are done afterwards. Then highly sensitive, this, it's a very highly sensitive method used in search lab and clinical diagnostic lab. So in the first step, you have halogen uh, tungsten uh, lamp here. Uh, then uh, what you do is excitation filters are there, they will activate them and they will go through with the help of prism and fall onto your sample plate. And then there will be intensifiers which will, uh, which will be transferred through them and CCD chip will be there and then you will see your things like that. So this is how you plot your PCR, uh, in, this is with the cycle number and amount of DNA. Uh, so with each cycle number and by the 34th cycle, you, you will have this much of your amount of DNA produced. This huge number of amount of DNA. And then, amount of uh, DNA producing in the case of uppercase, uh, per cycle number, PCR cycle number, so amount of DNA uh, is being produced like this in the, in the uh, lag phase first, then exponential, then stationary phase and this is linear uh, in this cycle number. So this is, um, uh, this is how you calculate your uh, relative expression values in real time PCR. So this is the baseline first of all and these are two values of two samples, sample A and sample B. So this is CTA and then this is CTB of the threshold they have calculated after the log linear phase that have been extended, so sample A and sample B. And then this is the baseline and this is the fluorescence light is coming up. And this is whole is log linear phase uh, in there. This is the baseline and this is again stationary phase. So let's uh, watch how PCR is done, RTP behind it. Oops. So in the real time PCR, uh, you take a Tacman master mix already prepared 25 microliter per sample then you add for forward primers 5 microliter forward and reverse primers 5 microliters to a sample Then prepare the reaction mixture with the Tartman probe. Then allocate them into the 96 well plate. Then add complementary DNA molecules, cDNA. Then cover the plate with micro seal films.
then we put them into the real P uh, PCR machine where we select the sample where we have added and this is how you see your tubes then you analyze the results afterwards this is how you get the peaks like this one sorry students I will be not taking care of um, the analysis part please go through it on your own I will be just sharing here today with you techniques what is the basic behind it how is the basic principle looks like and how you do it actually and to know about its calculations and to how it is done in detail manner um, that will be if you are doing into going to the any lab or anywhere they, they, they have the specific protocols for doing so so don't worry much about it now that you don't have the protocol to do the RT-PCR and how to analyze the data it's just a five minutes work it's not because every lab has its own thing every lab has its own softwares every lab has its own technique to analyze it so it's depend from lab to lab so whatever if I teach you might be different from another lab so so I, I don't have this data because I did it quite before but I have the basic principles at the moment sorry for that I uh, really apologize so you analyze this data so you will have all the samples data you will have some CA value and CB value uh, uh, which could be done to calculate your results for the previous formula so that was something about uh, how you do a uh, do RT-PCR technique how the machine works for you and automatically with the help of software you can analyze the data and uh, then next uh, let's see how COVID tests are done it's this is quite exciting uh, very interesting thing so let's check this one by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 when a person is infected, the most common symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. To start a test, the samples can be collected by a nasopharyngeal swab or an oropharyngeal swab. For nasopharyngeal specimen, the swab is inserted in the nostril and gently moved forward into the nasopharynx. Then it is rotated for a specified period time to collect secretions that contain the virus. Once the swabbing is applied, the swab is placed immediately into sterile tube containing a viral transport medium. The standard method of coronavirus testing is polymerase chain reaction, PCR, which is a method that used widely in molecular biology to make millions to billions of copies of a specific DNA fragment rapidly. Coronaviruses contain an extraordinarily long single-stranded RNA genome. To detect these viruses with PCR, RNA molecules must be converted into their complementary DNA sequences by reverse transcriptase. Then the newly synthesized DNA can be amplified by standard PCR procedures. This approach is universally known as RT-PCR. To perform this method, basically viral RNA should be extracted. Several RNA purification kits are available for convenient, fast and effective isolation. To extract the viral RNA by using commercial kit, the sample is first added into a microcentrifuge tube. Then it is mixed with a lysis buffer. This buffer is highly denaturing and is usually consists of phenol and guanidine isothiocyanate. Also, RNAs inhibitors are usually present in the lysis buffer to ensure isolation of intact viral RNA. Once the lysis buffer is added, the tube is mixed by pulse vortexing and incubated at room temperature. Then the virus is lysed under the highly denaturing conditions provided by the lysis buffer. Once the sample is lysed, a purification procedure is carried out by using a spin column. The sample is loaded onto the spin column. Then a centrifugation is performed. This procedure is a solid phase extraction method in which the stationary phase consists of a silica matrix. Under optimal salt and pH conditions, RNA molecules are bind to the silica gel membrane, and at the same time, protein and other contaminants are not retained. After centrifugation, the spin column is placed into a clean collection tube, and the filtrate is discarded. Then a wash buffer is added. The column is put in a centrifuge again, forcing the wash buffer through the membrane. This removes any remaining impurities from the membrane, leaving only the RNA bound to the silica gel. Once the sample is washed, the column is placed in a clean microcentrifuge tube, and an elution buffer is added. 
Then, a centrifugation is carried out, forcing the elution buffer through the membrane. The elution buffer removes the viral RNA from the spin column. And a purified RNA, which is free of protein, inhibitors, and other contaminants is obtained. After the extraction of the viral RNA, the next step is the preparation of the reaction mixture for PCR amplification. In this step, a master mix is used which is a premixed concentrated solution that consists of buffer, reverse transcriptase enzyme, nucleotides, forward primer, reverse primer, Tachman probe, and DNA polymerase. Finally, to complete this reaction mixture, the RNA template is added. The tube is mixed by pulse vortexing. Then the reaction mixture is loaded into a PCR plate, which generally contains 96 wells, allowing the analysis of several samples at the same time. Next, the plate is placed in a PCR machine, which is essentially a thermal cycler. Real-time RT-PCR is used for the detection of the new coronavirus 2019 by the amplification of target sequences in the RDRP gene, the E gene and the N gene. The choice of the target gene depends on the primers and the probe sequences. The first step in RT-PCR is reverse transcription. The first strand complementary DNA synthesis is primed with the PCR reverse primer, which hybridizes to a complementary part of the virus RNA genome. Reverse transcriptase then adds DNA nucleotides onto the three prime end of the primer, synthesizing DNA complementary of the viral RNA. The temperature and duration of this step depend on the primer, the target RNA, and the reverse transcriptase used. Next, an initial denaturation step is applied, causing denaturation of the RNA DNA hybrids. This step is required for the activation of DNA polymerase and simultaneously the inactivation of reverse transcriptase. PCR consists of a series of thermal cycles, with each cycle consisting of denaturation, annealing, and extension steps. Denaturation step consists of heating the reaction chamber to 95 degrees Celsius, and it is used for denaturation of the double-stranded DNA template. In the next step, the reaction temperature is lowered to 58 degrees Celsius, allowing annealing of the forward primer to its complementary part of the single-stranded DNA template. The annealing temperature relies directly on length and composition of the primers. In the extension step, the DNA polymerase synthesizes a new DNA strand complementary to the DNA template strand by adding free nucleotides from the reaction mixture that are complementary to the template in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The temperature at this step depends on the DNA polymerase used. After the first cycle, the double-stranded DNA target is obtained. Then, the denaturation of this double-stranded DNA is performed, yielding two single-stranded DNA molecules. In the next step, the reaction temperature is lowered, allowing annealing of the primers to each of the single-stranded DNA templates, and annealing of the Tachman probe to its complementary part of the target DNA. Tachman probe consists of a fluorophore covalently attached to the 5' prime end of the oligonucleotide probe. The fluorescence is emitted by the fluorophore when it is excited by the cycler's light source. Also, this probe consists of a quencher at the 3' prime end. The close proximity of the reporter to the quencher prevents detection of its fluorescence. In the extension step, DNA polymerase synthesizes new strands. When the polymerase reaches a Tachman probe, its endogenous 5' prime nuclease activity cleaves the probe, separating the dye from the quencher. With each cycle of PCR, more dye molecules are released, resulting in an increase in fluorescence intensity, proportional to the amount of amplicant synthesized. This method allows the estimation of the amount of a given sequence present in a sample. The number of double-stranded DNA pieces is doubled in each cycle, therefore, PCR can be used to analyze extremely small amounts of sample. For the measurement of the fluorescence signal, a tungsten halogen lamp, an excitation filter, mirrors, lens, an emission filter, and a charge-coupled device CCD camera are used. Filtered light from the lamp is reflected off-mirror, passes through a condensing lens, and is focused into the center of each well. Then fluorescent light emitted from the wells reflects off the mirror, passes through an emission filter, and is detected by the CCD camera. In each PCR cycle, light from excited fluorophore can be detected by the CCD camera. 
which converts the light that it captures into digital data. This method is known as real-time PCR, which allows the monitoring of the progress of the PCR reaction as it occurs in real time. So, any of your doubts will be cleared with this nice uh, video about uh, RT-PCR. Now comes the DNA uh, microarray technique uh, which helps to analyze the genome wide expression. So DNA microarray technique consists of thousands of individual genes sequences bound to closely spaced regions on the surface of a glass microscope slide or synthesized uh, sequence on a chip surface. So DNA microarrays allow the simultaneous analysis of expression of thousands of genes. So here you can see that there is a fibroblast without serum, fibroblast with serum. So we isolate the total mRNA and reverse this transcribe uh, to C complementary DNA to have a fluorescent dye out of it. Then you have a green dye, then you have a red dye. Then you mix them, hybridize to DNA microarray, wash them, measure the green and red fluorescence over each spot. So you have complementary DNA hybridized to DNA for single gene. Uh, then you have uh, gene A and gene B present on these slides. A spot is green expression of that gene decreases in, sim, uh, in cells after serum additions. And B uh, in the spot B is red expression of gene increase in the cells after the serum addition. So green is without serum and red is with the serum added. So that's how a DNA microarray looks like at the end. Each spot contains many copies of unlabeled DNA probe. Uh, corresponding to the part of one specific mRNA and label complementary DNA hybridized to spots where there is sequence of match or identical level in the both samples. That's the bioinformatic in vivo analysis of the same data. So let's uh, go through one short video about it. This animation will demonstrate how DNA microarray experiments are performed. DNA microarrays, sometimes called DNA chips, reveal the expression of thousands of genes on a solid surface, such as a microscope slide. In this example, we'll use yeast as a model system to illustrate one use of microarrays. One common use of microarrays is to determine which genes are activated and which are repressed when two populations of cells are compared. Every gene is measured simultaneously. As an example, we'll compare what happens to yeast genes when cells are grown in aerobic versus anaerobic conditions. The cells grow and adjust which genes need to be activated or repressed in order to survive. Now it is time to isolate the mRNA from both populations of cells. The cells are spun in a centrifuge. Now that the cells have gathered in pellets, we remove the liquid, but not the cells. Next, it is time to extract the mRNA from the cells. When we add the extraction buffer, the mRNA is released into the solution. Next, we remove the RNA and place it in a fresh tube. Now, let's make the cDNA from the mRNA. Here we see three of the many mRNA molecules from each tube of cells. Each mRNA is converted into red or green colored cDNA. When the colored cDNA is made, the mRNA degrades. Then we combine the red and green cDNA, mixing both colors into a single tube. At last, it's time to look at the DNA microarray. In our experiment, a microarray or DNA chip contains about 6,000 spots. Each spot is a different yeast coding sequence from a different gene. Let's choose three spots at random to follow in detail. Each spot is made of DNA that can base pair with its complementary cDNA. Here are partial sequences from each of the three spots we are observing. Now, let's incubate the mixed cDNA with the DNA chip. For the sake of our example, we'll zoom in and show that some of the labeled cDNA have bound to the DNA in the spots and formed base pairings. Here we see green and red cDNA bound to this spot. 
Only red cDNA is bound to this spot. And only green cDNA bound to this other spot. In a real experiment, you would not see any of this detail. You would only see the original microarray. Now we must wash off the unbound cDNA to see what is bound to the microarray. Let's detect the bound cDNA so it can be visualized. We begin by placing the microscope slide containing the microarray inside a scanner. We'll examine the next phase of the process, keeping our focus on the three spots we've been following. First, a green laser scans the microarray. The resulting image is stored on a computer for later analysis. Now it's time for the red laser. This image is also stored on a computer for later analysis. Now, we move to the analysis phase. After we eject and safely store the microscope slide, we retrieve the red and green images from the computer and create a merged visualization. In the merged image, we see an aerobic gene labeled in green, an anaerobic gene labeled in red, and a gene labeled in yellow that was expressed in both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. This is one example of how DNA microarrays are used. In an actual experiment, quantitative analysis would be conducted on all 6,000 genes. That was about DNA micro -S. I hope that was clear with you students. So now we do one small one virtual lab of DNA microarray. I hope no one is sleeping, everyone is awake with interesting things so far. So let's click. So well, let's see first of all what is gene and how uh, the basic behind it. So typically scientists, uh, those kind of studies on one of the uh, may, maybe few genes at a time, but leaving things, a lot of genes have been there. So there are almost around 20,000 genes and it would take long time to analyze them. So for that, we have this microarray technique. Uh, so wouldn't it be great that if you could study uh, so many genes at the same times, even better for your one single experiments. So genetics uh, is there like this and this is the genomics. So that's a bold uh, ambition but the kind of thinking has transformed 20th century and genetics into 21st century genomics. So every gene of each organism is different. So let's measure uh, each gene expression to see how powerful genomics can be. Let's take a closer look at what makes uh, things in our body from one another. So you can see skin cells, muscle cells, pancreatic cells, erythroblast, uh, melanocytes, all these cells. So there's tens of uh, genes which will be on like gene uh, 2 is on, gene 3 is on and but gene 1 and gene 4 is off. So how do you know whether a gene is turned on? Well, one is way to determine if it's working, uh, tuning out molecules of messenger RNA or molecular biologists, but gene is being expressed. So you have mRNA out of it, and then you have actin and myosin proteins. But in muscle cells, these genes are on, uh, actin and myosin, but your melanin and insulin, they're off.
So in gene expression in muscles, you have actin, myosin, cyclin, ubiquitin, histone 2B, they are all on and the rest is all off. And the same way in the pancreatic isolate cells, gene expressions, uh, you have uh, myosin and melanin off but the rest is all on. So that's where the DNA microarrays come in and using the DNA microarrays, researchers can pinpoint all the differences in the gene expression between two different cell types in a single experiment. So let's run the microarray experiments now. So before we begin uh, our experiments, uh, here how, how to make it. So these are the various steps uh, to run it. We go one by one. This is a portion of thousands of spots on the microarray and each, each spot represent one gene. So let's uh, take a, a closer look on them. So you have healthy cells. So let's do the experiment now. You have a healthy cell and you have a cancerous cells. And we are going to use the power of genomics to answer the important questions. What is the difference between healthy cells and cancer cells genomics? So in the cancerous cells, your gene 3 is broken and leads to the overproduction of cells. That's why you have mass production of cancerous cells in the, uh, in the cancerous cells. So gene, so what does cancer cells different from the normal cells? Cancer cell is basically a disease of uh, genes gone bad. Many genes control the way cell grow, divide and die. When these genes stop uh, working properly, cell growth can spin out the uh, control and leading to the tumor formation and cancer. So to be able to better diagnose, understand, of, understand and treat cancer it is key to which genes in the cancer cells are working abnormally. So it will be nice to know which genes lead to this uh, happening of the cancer cells. So experiments are divided into these seven steps. So first collecting of tissue, then isolate RNA, then isolate mRNA, make labels uh, DNA copy then apply DNA, uh, then scan microarray, then analyze the data. We need Appendorf, we need small tubes, we need scalpel, solvent solutions, pipette man, tips, vortex, micro centrifuge, columns with oligo uh, DT beads, buffer solutions, green and red labeling mix, microarray washing solutions, uh, scanner and workstation. So we need all these things. So we have a cancerous tissue here uh, which has a melanoma here I guess and we will take this from the patient. So from the cancerous we took the tissue of cancerous cells and also the normal healthy cell to compare it. So now with the help of solvent, we will isolate the RNA. Now we vortex them. so that everything is mixed together and then we micro centrifuge it. So the liquid part will be the RNA and other stuff will be protein, DNA and other stuff. We take the RNA with the help of micro pipette. So 
The sample contains several different types of RNA, messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA and then we press next to continue. So mRNA molecules, so this is how your mRNA molecules have and you have poly A tail attached to them. You have also transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA. So you have three different type of RNAs but we need mainly the mRNA. So for that we use these column beads, close-up beads. So they have single beads and they have poly T attached to, to these beads, poly T chains. We take the solution and add to the column 1. Then we add this to the column 2. So by doing so, uh, all the tRNA and ribosomal RNA will be removed and mainly the messenger RNA will remain in these beads because of the T tail that attached to it. So poly a tail will attach to this micro uh, poly T tail. So A and T they will be attached together like this. And messenger RNA is attached to these beads then. Take the buffer solution, drag and pip it over the healthy column. Now we will add green labeling mix and red labeling mix to it. So we have our RNA now and we will add so you have poly A tail, poly T primer will be attached, reverse transcriptor will be attached to it and we have labeled nucleotides attached to it. So in this labeling mixture of green it contains poly T primers, reverse transcriptase and labeled nucleotides. So which bind to the poly A tails on the mRNA and it's an enzyme, enzyme which will and reverse transcriptase which will uh, synthesize the standard complementary DNA and labeled nucleotides which will help to incorporate into the new complementary DNA. So all so now with the help of these dyes your complementary DNA is being produced. So now you will remove the mRNA, you have no complementary DNA which is labeled green now. In the healthy cells and the red cancer cells they will be labeled with the red. So they are separated and they can join again and if they can join again that process is called as hybridization. So so they will hybridize on these chips. So we have different DNA sequences and same DNA sequence in the same, same chain. So on the each uh, in these chips in the circles. Uh, each chip has different gene but in the within the same chip we have different uh, genes. So we have spot numbers and each spot number is representing one gene and we will add our both samples. into this microarray chip and red one also. So now red on the red uh, mainly your cancer cDNA hybridized will be spotted out on the green uh, mainly your healthy hybridized cell will be spotted out. On the yellow, 
mainly the green and red both are spotted out so green and yellow both which are attached to it they will be spotted out rest unhybridized label c dna they will be not seen and on which it's not attached they will be white so you have three different four different colors white red green and yellow so we will wash the extra complementary dna that is bound to it by adding to the washing solution then scan microarray then scan it so we scan first green all the green spots with the healthy cells they are being spotted out and the dark spots are the one which are not transcribed and not being seen there now we will scan the red part so all the red spots have been transcribed with the cancerous cells now we will merge merge them together red and green so we will see a lot of yellow parts there so here are the red and green spots merged together any spots that contain both red and green complementary dna shows up as yellow so yellow spots contain that is hybridized to both green and red complementary dna which means that genes genes are expressed both in cancer cells and healthy cells so genes that show up as yellow spots probably aren't very interesting to us because they are both are present since the activity doesn't change when the cell becomes cancerous but look at the red spots and all all the green spots so we are more interested with the red and green spots so they are the more specific genes that we were interested in red spots show the genes which produce more mrna in the cancer cells than the healthy cells so they turned up in the cancer cells so more mrna was produced and they were that's why we see uh, these cancer cells that mainly depending upon on this color and the green spot shows uh, whose expression is turned down in the cancer cells uh, they are not being expressed in the cancer cells so you are a searcher studying the uh, cancer genes and and have an increased level of activity in the skin cancer cells which color spot should you choose to study so question is here students for you you are a researcher interested in studying genes and that increased level of activity in cancer cells skin cancer cells what color spot should you choose red green yellow or black tell me red green yellow or black so what will you choose if you are interested with the cancer cells red green yellow or black red yes red spot represent the genes that are turned up in the cancer cells and we see lot of red cells there that have gone bad no many of these these genes red genes are normal they are the red on the microarray because they are controlled by the gene that gone bad so gene 4263 is one of the genes that turned up in the cancer cells 
and produce protein products whose role is to turn down the expression of several other genes. What color are the spots that are turned down by the gene 4263? Green spot. Gene 4263 are turned down sets of the uh, genes yes represented by the green spots on our microarray and gene 6219 is normally turned on in skin cells in our skin uh, cancerous uh, samples these genes is defective so while the genes will still reproduce uh, microRNA the defect prevents the microRNA from being translated into proteins what color is, is gene into 6219 uh, in our microRNA green one sorry yellow one so these are the yellow ones are the spotted for both uh, cancer and healthy cells so but in the cancer cells these genes does not produce proteins but the healthy cells they are producing the proteins So that was a microarray. Okay. Students, I need a five minutes break. I'm a bit tired now. So I will just come back and then we start again. I just need five minutes break. I will be good then. Then we start with next topic of... So we are done, half is done. Maybe we extend by tomorrow by 10. But we will start at 9.30 now.
so students still with me some are still with me so i will not take much of your time because i think most of the students half the students have left the sessions uh, because of the being time late and uh, keeping that in mind so everyone should learn from the topic and uh, so we keep it short and crisp today from now onwards Uh, so investigating genes with the biotechnology approaches is important because we have applied therapeutic uh, cloning so we produce big amount of identical copies of dna of interest so we have the gain of functions analysis expression of genes in other organisms and uh, further uh, gmos are being produced uh, with the knockout uh, knock in and mutant transgenes genes generating improved agriculture crops with resistance against vermin or having increased content of healthy proteins in farming a uh, generation of healthy animals with improved production uh, of 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 production potential uh, there is a way of uh, dna cloning with plasmid vectors um, in this recombinant dna technology enables to produce large number of uh, identical dna molecules clones are typically generated by placing the dna fragments of interest into a vector and dna molecule which can uh, replicate in bacterial host cells and so this is how your uh, your dna looks your plasmid looks like plas uh, plasmid cloning vector you have polylinkers multiple cloning sites you have uh, ampicillin resistance genes you have origin of replications so these are all things that are required so what happen in the process uh, process of cloning of a genes you have your uh, plasmid vector you have a dna fragments and enzymatically insert dna into the plasmid vector and then recombinant plasmids are mixed uh, with with plasmids in presence of calcium chloride culture on the nutrient agars placed place on the containing the ampicillin so bacterium chromosomes transform e coli cell survives cells that do not take up plasmids die on the ampicillin plates so we have independent plasmid uh, replications are happening then uh, cell multiplications and cloning of cells each containing copies of the same recombinant plasmids are produced then plasmid cloning um, permits isolation of dna fragments from uh, complex mixtures so plasmid vectors a uh, dna fragments to be cloned and then transform e coli cells and select ampicillin resistance colonies so each colony represents one clone here you can also restrict them with the restriction enzymes cut them at the base pairs and then you can have sticky ends afterwards and you have palindromic sequences like ana auto radar coyok so these are the various restriction enzymes which are cutting at the specific sites of your uh, recognition sites uh, leading to sticky ends and blunt ends and their restriction fragments with complementary sticky ends are uh, ligated easily so here you can see dna1 and dna2 and then we can ligate them with the with the dna a actually not the b and c because they are the one which have a a t t so they are paired with them then uh, we have a recombinant dna like this one short video about this uh, clone cloning vectors because they carry an origin of replication and are therefore able to replicate independently within a cell most plasmids used as vectors also encode some type of selectable marker such as the gene for resistance to ampicillin if the host cells are ampicillin sensitive the only host cells that can grow on a medium containing ampicillin are those that have taken up the plasmid vectors must also have a small sequence of base pairs that can be recognized by a restriction enzyme when this enzyme opens the circular plasmid foreign dna can be incorporated when the plasmid vector and foreign dna are both cut with the same restriction enzyme and mixed together not all molecules will join to form recombinants some vector molecules will reanneal without incorporating foreign dna 
To identify cells that contain plasmids that have incorporated foreign DNA, a second marker gene is needed on the vector. This second marker contains the restriction enzyme site within its nucleotide sequence. If foreign DNA is inserted, the second marker is inactivated. This is referred to as insertional inactivation. A common second marker is the LAC-Z gene, which codes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase can cleave a colorless chemical called X-gal to form a blue compound. Therefore, colonies of cells that harbor the intact vector, but no new recombinant DNA, can make beta-galactosidase and form a blue color in the presence of X-gal. However, colonies that contain new recombinant DNA cannot make beta-galactosidase and are white. So that was something about cloning. So you can also do the polylinkers facilitate uh, the insertion of uh, uh, fragments in the plasmid vector. So you have sequence of polylinkers. So you can have uh, your E. coli restriction uh, fragments and you have genomic DNA. And then uh, with the E. coli you restrict them. And then with the help of DNA ligase and ATP you join them. So you have a recombinant plasmid. Uh, with a sequence of polylinkers attached to it and then cloning the transcriptome <coughs> complementary dna libraries are prepared from the isolated micro uh, uh, messenger rnas uh, so you have mixture of cytoplasmic rna oligo -DT, uh, dt matrix and then you have being attached to these matrix and wash away the reposomal rna and elude the column in the like we did in the uh, DNA microarray. So same way you can have purified mRNA separations. So to most common uh, to clone DNA, the most common approach is to identify specific clone involved screening a library by hybridization with the radioactive label DNA and then labeled DNA nucleotide probes are used to identify specific nucleotide sequence in the complex mixture of DNA or mRNA then direct sequences are also often applied to the single nucleotide sequences or the large scale sequencing. So I think uh, we make it uh, done here. So we do the sequencing from tomorrow onwards. We're done with the cloning part today. And uh, I will share the slides tomorrow with you, not this one today, so that uh, we are on the same, same level. So it will take a lot of time because sequencing is a whole huge topic. So I want to uh, start this with tomorrow to only so that we can have a fresh start for tomorrow. Is it okay if we start tomorrow from here onwards students? Please uh, reply to me. We make, we make these sessions of two hours today done and then we can start uh, from fresh start tomorrow. So basically we did uh, a lot about uh, tissue culture today, we learned about PCRs, we learned about uh, RT-PCR, we learned about uh, cloning, we learned about microarrays, we learned about uh, how RT-PCR COVID-19 test has been done, how to analyze a little bit this data, a little bit about southern blotting, northern blotting, agrocell electrophoresis uh, and PCR. So basically. Uh, we are done, half is done, recombinant DNA technology is done. So we, had, we have to do tomorrow Sanger sequencing, uh, Sanger sequencing and next generation sequencing and method to study gene functions. So these, so for assignment who want to send it so they can make it tomorrow onwards. So because we are not done for today also. So we, we or we, I can, sh I can share you uh, the presentation. It's okay. So that uh, whosoever wants to make uh, assignment for today, whatever we have done, they can go with it.
this is more than 100 MB. So Google Drive, 